Hey guys, so today we're going to have the speaker. His name is Mr. Erwin Kerwin Kobeli, and he's from IPI, which is Integrated Polymer Industries. And he's a very good chemical engineer, and he's here to talk to us about how we're going to uh, have like a successful engineering careers in like private industries. So give a round of applause. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Okay, um, well, thank you for coming. I don't um, think we can see this well. Is it possible to turn I don't think we okay. can see That's this well. Good. Is it possible right. to turn this? Okay. That Let's start with introductions. My name is Ergun Kiriko Valley. I'm a polymer scientist with a degrees in chemistry and polymer science. I worked as a product development chemist in, uh, for three different companies. Now, Engineering uh, uh, jobs and careers, you can't see the top line there, but uh, you got to start somewhere. One of my topics today will be a careers in private industry with emphasis on petrochemicals, pharmaceutical, food processing, oil and gas, plastics, coatings, adhesives, and other in this industries that involve chemistry one way or the other. And of course, that includes research and development. I started my own business in 1985. Name of the company is Integrated Polymer Industries. We design and develop polymer-based, interpenetrating networks based adhesives, coatings, uh, sealants for aerospace industry. And um, you might be familiar with uh, B2s. We're um, uh, developing products for them to make them stealthy or invisible to radar. And uh, because of that, I will also talk about starting your own business. When do you think you're ready? Are you really ready? We'll talk about that. Starting your own business, when are you ready? Um, there's ideas, strategy, success. We'll talk about all of that. Um, and there are some do's and don'ts. And then last 10, 15 minutes, maybe more, uh, we'll leave for your questions. Now, first, some ground rules. College education here teaches you how to learn. So when you're finished here, don't be thinking that you know it all. It's really your starting point. You'll learn a lot more in the industry the moment you set foot in any establishment. So be prepared mentally for that. That means a lot of reading, writing, uh, researching, learning. Another ground rule is that industry likes high performance who are team players. You want to get on with your colleagues and peers. In college, it's OK to have some problems with friends and whatever. But in industry, it doesn't sit well. No industry likes troublemakers. No industry likes um, people who spoil the team spirit. This is very important. Of course, you got to stay away from all these nasty stuff, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. Believe me, no industry likes to hire people with known addictions. So my humble suggestion, if you have any of these inclinations, cut them out now. Be systematic and clean. Look at these laboratories. Uh, it's OK to leave your bedroom at home all cluttered. Your mom will take care of it. Not so in the industry. In the industry, they will ask you or expect from you to leave your lab or office space spotless clean and systematic. Your notes are in place, dates, signatures, references, all clear. Good handwriting. Yes, you can rely on the keyboard, but sometimes you can't take your computer everywhere. So you can't write gibberish, and then you can't even write, read your own writing. You can't imagine how many times we're seeing situations where we have test reports. There are some very important numbers and explanation, but we can't read them. It's written by, three, four, by, a, by a friend three, four, five months ago. He's not around, so we can't read this stuff. That's no good. And uh, the most important rule of all is be innovative. 
Now, you got to make a difference. First four ground rules, I expect everybody to have. This one is where you make the difference. I believe creativity, contrary to common belief, is something teachable. It's not genetic. Most people will say, well, this guy was born with skills and this and that. Eh, I don't go for that. I believe innovation is teachable. That's one of my strongest messages today. And I have developed some tools to share with you today where you can teach somebody to be innovative. Innovation, if based on research and development, creates added value. Now, what is added value? Not everything is added value. I just created this sample for you. If you sell the cotton from the field, you can maybe make a dollar a kilo. But now if you, we, you know, make a thread out of it, now your income goes up to $3 per kilo. Now if you weave it, it's $5 a kilo. If you make t-shirts out of it, it's $10 a kilo. If you make shirts out of it, you can make $30 out of it. If you make trademark, beautiful colored t-shirts, you can make $50 out of it. As you go in this direction, added value goes up. This is very important because not every effort is added value. Added value creates prosperity for all. Why is one car here more expensive than the other? And why is smartphone today is more expensive than the old um, the, um, cell phones? There's added value there. Added value comes from innovation and research and development. What is innovation and what is R&D? Let's talk a little about that. Now, what is not innovation is what you see here. You take you know, all of these samples, they're self-explanatory. Uh, these are from real life. One guy adds one more leg and it becomes whatever. This, it, instead of height, he, Nike, he says height. You know, these are not uh, innovation. These are poor imitations. There are a lot of words for that in English. Trite, banal, cliche, overused, boilerplate, old hat, corny, cheesy, commonplace, and on and on and on. You want to stay away from those. You, I'm talking about innovation here. If innovation, though, if imitation is improved, then it passes as innovation. For example, Xerox company, the giant, uh, sued Microsoft, Microsoft many years ago, saying they stole all our secrets and then came up with whatever. But they lost. And uh, that's because Apple didn't use everything as they received. They put a lot more thinking on it, a lot more R&D. So it became an Apple product. This shows you that uh, imitation is not all that bad if it motivates you to create a better product. Uh, the introduction of something new, a new idea, method, or device, it has to be some sort of novelty. You cannot just take something and change a letter in it or make a minor change and pass it as innovation. It's not going to happen. As you can see, uh, innovation can come from many, many sources. It can come from individuals, corporations, end users, employees, outsiders, spillovers, brainstorming. You will not be away from a good idea um, as long as you're careful and you're like listening to people. Sometimes even jokes can trigger some innovation. It could be a stupid joke, but you could say, hey, wait, wait a minute. That's stupid, but this could follow. So you have to be alert all the time when, when there's an atmosphere of brainstorming going on. In fact, one of the rules in brainstorming is that you don't make fun of people who say stupid things. You don't. It's not the idea. The idea is throw all the f ideas out and see which one survives. And then somebody says something. Somebody else adds onto it. That's a teamwork. Now, uh, here's the six, uh, one of the, uh, we call them the six eyes of innovation. The first one is inspiration. You might remember these uh, 
TV shows from way back in the 1960s, the guy would uh, talk to his shoe and we'd all laugh. But look what happened in the 1980s. It became a reality. And look, look, look what happened today, 2018. You have smartphones. It all started from this stupid joke. Investigation, of course. Late 1980s, research shows it is possible to have cell phones uh, to send emails. That was an idea. Go ahead. Um, ideation is very important. In mid-1990s, maybe we can have cell phones that can do more than just send emails. Now, I remember uh, Stephen Jobs coming on TV and saying, Oh, t iPhones will do this, will do that. And I'm looking at my phone, I said, how the hell is he going to do that? I'm looking around, and whereas he had the ideation. I didn't, he did. So you have to think outside the box. I guess it's a bit cliche, but that's what it is. Iteration. You don't hit the jackpot in the first try. Never. Nobody does. If you have an idea, you put a prototype out, Test it, and then you see, hey, this doesn't work. Pull it a little bit. That's too far. Cut it a little bit. Add this, subtract that, and it keeps moving. Apple does it every day. I mean, what's the iteration level now on iPhones? We're up to 10, 11, whatever. Identification. Apple has, has identified the first product. That's why all the others are following. Uh, it is important that if you have an idea, you put the first prototype out because you make your stamp then. Others will follow. And implementation. You may have a wonderful idea, but you may not put it on the market. Well, what can I tell you? It's a missed opportunity. Yeah, creating your own company is, is a lot of strife, a lot of work, this and that. But if you don't do it, you'll be blaming yourself the rest of your life. I should have done it. I should have done it. So let's talk a little bit about R&D. It's investigative activities that a business chooses to conduct with the intention of making a discovery that can either lead to development of new products or improvement of existing products and procedures. So you don't do R&D for the sake of doing R&D. You have a goal. You want to reach there. What does R&D do for you? Research and development is an investment in technology and future capabilities, which is transformed into new products, processes, and services. R&D is crucial uh, for innovation and the key factor in developing new competitive advantages. What does R&D support? Uh, OK, we do a lot of R&D, but who do we support? Well. We create knowledge and technology, and they are the two main ingredients of innovation. R&D directly supports the development of both. When you do R&D, you're not starting from zero. You're actually building on the work of millions of others. You don't even realize that. So um, R&D is a very, very important part of industrial life. And then don't forget, R&D is a tool. When a company takes the time to invest in R&D, they create a huge influx of use, useful knowledge that can be used to improve their main product line. If leadership in the market are important, then R&D is essential. Now, I can name you hundreds of companies here, big companies, who spend a lot of money on R&D. They have R&D buildings, chemists, chemical engineers, all kinds of engines, mechanical engines, and so on. Uh, and those guys, they don't have a manufacturing uh, uh, job. They have, their job is to create new technologies, new information. Can you believe that? I mean, 8 to 5, in fact, it's 24-7. That's all they do. That's all they think about. So R&D leads to innovation, and innovation leads to added value. R&D provides know-how, technology, skills. R&D opens the door to innovation. Innovation brings added value. Added value brings prosperity. Innovation can be taught. I have heard a lot that, oh, uh, 
innovation is ingrown, ingrown. It's like genetic. You have to have it in your genes. I don't buy that. I may be right. I may be wrong. But I strongly believe that innovation is a teachable skill. And I will share some of the tools I developed with you today. So you'll be innovators today. You're so lucky. You're getting it for nothing. Rule number one. We call this the opposites rule. I mean, I call this the opposites rule. You take something, you, t you think you're to yourself, what if I make this smaller? In fact, the smallest. Or make it bigger, or biggest. What if I do it a bit slower, a bit faster, heavier, lighter, strongest, weakest, brightest, dullest, forward, reverse? You keep doing this. At some time, a door opens in your brain and says, you know what? I'll walk through there. I think there is something there. But if you don't do this checkup, I call this a checkup, uh, you don't know. So you have to test yourself on this. I call this the opposites rule. That's tool number one. Tool number two is BDA. That's what I call BDA. That's before, during, after. You take something. You say, well, where was this before? Well, it was like three pieces. They got together. Who created those? Well, this guy did this, this. And how did they do it? And then you learn all that, and you know how, how it came here. So what does it do now? It does this, 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 this. Well, what will it do tomorrow? It will do this, 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 this. Can I change this? Can I change something here to make it better? Now, these are all brain exercises. If it's done with a brainstorming team, it's better. But not all of us have that luxury. So sometimes you have to do it yourself. Okay, so this is the BDA rule. Rule number three, or I call it tool number three. This is what I call biomimicry. It may come as a surprise to some of you that Mother Nature has most of the answers, but we don't know. I can list here hundreds of situations like Velcro came from uh, a study of, of some bugs in Switzerland, how they hung on the plants when they looked at it on the microscope, they saw the hook and loop, and then they created Velcro. Um, there are a lot of examples like this. Um, they study the birds for best aerodynamics in the planes. They study some fish for best design in uh, submarines. So there is, if you look carefully, there might be a solution that Mother Nature provided, what you do then is you study that closely. You say to yourself, how does that do it? How does that do it? Like, how does a bee find its way from certain flower and then sends millions of bees in that direction? You know, if you study biology a little closer, you might find some answers. We call this biomimicry. Oh, the last one is serendipity. And uh, most of the products that you see, most of them are created by chance. I'll give you an example. The car tires, created by Goodyear first, 150 years ago. Mr. Goodyear himself, I mean, like, uh, the story goes, he was in a cold room in the winter, on a winter day. Uh, the stuff was going on. He was working on some... Mix, mixtures, and part of the mixture fell on the stove, and then he didn't realize, but later on, when the stove was cold, he peeled it off, he saw something very interesting. It was like rubber, and what is this? Then he started thinking, maybe I can recreate this, recreate this. Then he found sulfur vulcanization, and it went from there. So here's a guy doing some study here, and he's getting an unusual help from the stove. Now, there are hundreds of stories like that. So innovation cycle, after you get the idea, is like you gather information, review it, prioritize it, plan it, execute it, and integrate it. So even nature doesn't provide you the answers in like nicely cut, labeled, packages. You have to study it, classify it, prioritize it, review it, 
and, and uh, do some work on it. Recipe is simple. Research and development leads to innovation. Innovation leads to added value, which leads to prosperity. Innovation brings ad added value. Uh, everyone can innovate if proper training and conditions are allowed. Now, you can create this atmosphere in the companies that you will be working. You can create this atmosphere uh, instead of um, uh, trying to, and a competition is good, but instead of compete, 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 you might decide, hey, why don't we work together? This is what I'm working on. What do you think? You know? So this approach, we like this approach. Here's a young guy, Nikolai Beg. Of course, he's no longer young, but you can find him on the, in, on the internet. This guy was a third-year mechanical engineer. He had no idea about uh, medicine. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer. What does he know about medicine? And yet, he developed this, this uh, little gadget because when, when the, the doctors were using some syringes and they were going too deep and so on, whereas with this tool using mechanical structure, uh, he was able to have guaranteed results. He became a phenomenon. I mean, here's a guy who's, who kind of, you know, walked into this. He's not a doctor, but he, he felt that he had to find a solution to it. There are many forms of entrepreneurialism. One is iPreneur, online, like Amazon, eBay. These are what we call iPreneurs. Then intrapreneur, that means you can stay with a within a company and share your pro uh, ideas with the company and say, look, I don't want to split and start my own business. I want to stay within this company, but you uh, capitalize my ideas. Let me start this company within this larger company and let me get some share of it, 30, 40, 50%. You put the money, I'll put in the ideas. It happened, the Fiero cars, Ford, that's how it came about. It didn't go anywhere, but at least they didn't lose the brain. Uh, the brain still stayed with Ford Company. Uh, it was a good, good um, try in the industrial world. So that's intrapreneur. And of course, everybody knows entrepreneur, independent businessman. Now, innovation can happen in any field. This is micro-robotics. Robots, they are the size of ants. Again, this came from Sarah Bergbreiter and her team. And um, it has a lot of uses, some of them we don't even know yet. Innovation knows no limit in technology. Nakagawa felt the need for a camera while studying how acoustic shock, shock waves could, could change living cells. But um, it was happening so fast that human eye couldn't see it. No, 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 none of the cameras could. So he developed this camera that according to um, the article I read, you can find it in, in, in the, I think, in the internet, one trillion frames per second. This is so incredible that, what can I tell you? I mean, like, I couldn't even imagine one trillionth of a second. You can watch a chemical reaction take place. That is incredible. I mean, I can't even visualize something like that. And the US government supports innovation and SBIR programs. I won't go into that. We don't have too much time because I have other messages to give you. But uh, so that you know, if you have an idea, there are, there are places you can go to and turn that idea into something meaningful. SBAR is one of the most important programs. It's a three-phase program. First program, very quickly, the uh, first program is that uh, it's called feasibility. It's a small amount, like maybe $50,000, six months. They give you a project, and, and then they ask you, is this feasible? And what you do is you do a literature survey, talk to a few people, and try to come up with an answer, yay or nay. Now, if it's Feasible, then you go into the next phase, which is uh, more than one million and, and two years. That means in that time, <clears throat> you, um, you really work out the nuts and bolts. And um, 
actually put a, a living prototype on the table. No more argument. The argument is done in the first phase. And phase three is where the government can give that license to a big company, those Fortune 500s or others, who will pay the money and take over and manufacture it because it's a proven product. Prototype is there. So this is, uh, and there are a lot of U US universities who exploit this situation. Innovation kickstarted by government. Again, very quickly, we don't have that, that kind of time because I have other things to share with you. Um, 1957, uh, Russians landed Sputnik up in the um, space and the United States, everybody is panicking. Oh, well, if they can do this, they can bomb us, blah, blah, blah. Eisenhower times. So four or five months later, 1958, February, decision is made to establish ARPA at the time. Uh, and then it becomes DARPA with Defense D in front of it. But it basically, uh, the programs that I just uh, explained, major, 11 major agencies put down their X percent of their annual budget, create a pool of money. That money supports the R&D. And that R&D, fast forwarding to this day, is responsible for your laptops, for your iPhones, for many things, GPS, for many things that you use today. Now, there's a good message from the head of MIT Media Lab, and uh, I, I really like his message. Basically, he's saying how everybody likes to talk about future, what's going to happen in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and so on. What this guy is saying, forget the future. Evaluate now. Do it now. Forget the future. Do it now. Now is the future. That's what he's saying. You build it quickly. You improve constantly. Because if you do it now, others will build on it. So there are some dream stoppers that I'd like to share with you very quickly. Uh, do not believe in overnight success. It never happens. I know there are movies on that. But in real life, it takes a lot of work, a lot of years. So be prepared for that mentally. And uh, don't always think that, oh, somebody else has the answer. I got to find him. Sometimes nobody has the answer. Oh, one more. Um, and don't blame others for your fault. This happens in the industry. You do a test, it doesn't come out. And then you start blaming, well, he didn't come on time. He didn't turn well out. Forget all that. Try again. And uh, if you're successful, don't rest on your laurels. Now, um, th th these are some very s uh, small uh, examples. Problem recognition is the most important one. Uh, you don't go around and say, OK, let me do some R&D today. It's not, it doesn't work like that. There is a problem that, that you recognize. Everybody has that problem. And you're looking for a solution for that. That's real R&D. And then you come back with your problem-solving ideas. You test them. If it works, then you use the development in a business. It's, that's where the entrepreneurialism come, come into place. The idea is that, yeah, you found the problem, you solved it, you have the solution, but you didn't translate it into marketing. So it's on the shelf somewhere. It does nobody any good. <clears throat> Summary, innovation, entrepreneurialism lead to added value, which leads to prosperity. Now, I'd like to mention uh, very quickly some of the uh, situations that you will be faced with. Uh, being a chemist, polymer scientist, I will concentrate on chemical industry, which is huge. Um, you have petrochemicals, oil and gas, pharmaceuticals, food processing, water treatment, paper processing, chemical manufacturing, on and on and on. So more than likely, some of you in this room will end up in those industries. Now, I already shared with you some do's and don'ts. If you stick to innovation and those do's and don'ts, you'll be very successful, I know. Now, there are uh, major branches of chemistry, organic chemistry, inorganic, uh, analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, biochemistry. Now, organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. 
And inorganic chemistry is mostly uh, chemicals that do not have CH bonds. Uh, mostly, they contain metals. Um, analytical chemistry is the study of structure and mechanism of these materials and properties. Physical chemistry is chemistry where uh, science of physics is applied to chemistry. And biochemistry is the chemistry in living organisms. All the medical establishments, tests, they all use biochemistry. In fact, in medical schools, I think in, in like the first year, they teach you biochemistry. You, you can't go ahead without the biochemistry. So what do you do in, in, uh, in, when you get the job? Uh, do we have time? Yeah. What do we do? Um, <clears throat> we analyze organic and inorganic compounds, determine chemical and physical properties, composition, and so on. Analyze, that's one. What else? Well, we induce changes by applying heat, light, energy, and other sources to the products to change and modify them, improve them. And um, we do qualitative and quantitative analysis. What else do we do? We develop, improve, and customize products, equipment, processes. What else? Compile and an analyze data. Um, study effects of processing, preserving these chemicals. Prepare solutions, compounds to help others. And confer with other scientists, do brainstorming with them, try to explain situations. And then, of course, write technical papers. Now. Um, after you graduate, you'll look for work, you'll go to these companies, and uh, you'll pay attention to those five do's and don'ts. Um, these are serious people. You write a nice resume, you go there, and uh, what they want, will want to see in you, this is a starting job, is that, is this guy teachable? Is he, is he one of those who thinks everything, uh, who thinks that he knows everything? Or can I work with this guy? He, he doesn't expect you to know everything. He's got products, he's got processes, equipment, uh, labs. He'll employ you, but can he work with you? That's what he's thinking. The other thing is that he might throw your way a lot of hard work on some. You know nothing about it. You be honest. You tell him you've never seen this, you've never heard of it. It might be something like the guy might say, oh, well, I mean, they teach you in first year of college. How can you not know about this? Don't be intimidated by that. Be honest. Say, I'm sorry. I don't know about it. Teach me. Nothing wrong with that. So uh, they'll like that. They'll teach you, and you'll excel it. You go home. You do more reading, writing, you know, ask, learn. You excel on this. Then all of a sudden, you see you rise up. Okay? There's no other way. So <clears throat> these were about career planning. Now I want to talk about something totally different, which is starting your own business. I always say it in these lectures, uh, I go around to other universities and talk to young people like yourselves. The best preparation for your business is working for a large company for about two years, a medium company for about two years, small company for about two years. These are loose numbers. It could be one year, three years. But uh, the reason for that is each company has a different culture. Uh, you learn a lot from them. In the big company, they're resourceful, but they're slow. There are layers and layers and layers of management. You can't get an idea into action because they're so big. Memos have to be written, uh, and permissions have to be uh, gotten, and all that. Whereas on the small one, they're not resourceful, but they're fast. Before the big guys can move, the small guy already makes the prototype and puts it on the table. Their heads spin over there on the other side. But there are drawbacks to that, too. Because you don't have resources, you don't have all the tests. When a big company puts out a product, it's tested for years, and it's perfect. When a small guy puts out a product, well, there might be some problems. But 
the small guy being the small guy, he'll keep improving. So you learn that culture from. In the middle, middle mid-sized company, you have a little bit of both. So when you put four, five, six years of uh, that kind of experience behind you, and uh, most importantly, if you have a desire in you, it's like forest fire, no pun intended, uh, that burns you up. You get a good salary, you got a good job, you love your job, but no, you won't, you won't start your own business. If that's the kind of passion you have, then you're ready to start your business. But if you're saying, hmm, should I be starting my business? Please don't. Let me give you statistics. According to Bank of America, 97% of the new businesses fail within the first three years. So when you ask for uh, a loan from a bank, they'll usually, they'll be very polite. They won't say, uh, you're too new, I can't give you a loan. They'll just say, fill out this form, please. Well, the first question there is, give us your revenues for the last three years. Well, how can I have that? I, I just started my business. So don't be relying on that kind of you know, bank loans and this and that. First thing is you have to have the passion and the drive. Of course, the knowledge. You believe you have a product, you believe it will sell, fine, do it. If you fail, you learn from it, you'll do better the next time. Show me any businessman in America or anywhere in the world who did not make any mistakes. They all make mistakes. We don't even call them mistakes, we call them experience. So um, when you start your company, don't think that you're going to be rich overnight. There's no solution like that. There's no formula like that. You have to be persistent, work hard, be honest, and uh, develop the best product that you can develop, and the rest will take care of itself. So these are my messages to you today. What we discovered today is that, A, on the career side, there are some do's and don'ts. You really have to shape up, because the industry out there, it's a different world. They want to see certain types, um, team worker, high performer, um, no addictions, uh, innovative, real nice guy. That's what they want to see. And um, the job you will get may not be the best job that you think, but be patient because you'll get there. They might be testing you. They might be going through six months of a trial period. Be patient. Do the best you can. I, I hear this a lot from young people. Oh, well, I'm not making an impact. I'm going to leave. Well, what did you expect? I mean, it's like not even a year. So um, that takes care of the career part. On the starting your own business, don't rush into it. This is my suggestion. But put four, five, six years of industrial experience behind you. And don't just make it one company, because then you end up with learning one culture. Try to vary the sizes, if possible. So I will cut it right here, um, Ignor. If they have questions, we can discuss questions. Yeah. Talk to them a little bit about your company, how you did it. Very good. Well, first I started working for a mid-sized company in San Francisco Bay Area, San Carlos. I won't name the companies because they're still going around. And uh, I was doing product development there for two years on uh, concrete, like this is earthquake zone, when uh, earthquake happens and the uh, building shake, you have concrete cracking. So we would pump polymers in there to make them strong again, repair them. We would do bridge overlays and this and that. So after that, I mean, being a young fellow, I'm talking about 40 years ago, uh, I got bored with it. So I said, OK, I'm going to aerospace. And uh, then I came down to Los Angeles area and worked for, for an aerospace company. I was really excited there. And uh, we were doing composites and adhesives and sealants and all that. Labs, loved it. But after two years, it's my luck that I got an offer from New York. And that was another company. So, uh, and, and they lured me over there. Money was good. I went. And there, it was a totally different experience. Mostly mechanical engineering type of repairs, 
pipes, pumps, tanks, vessels, ships. So San Francisco concrete, Los Angeles aerospace, New York mechanical engine. If you put them all together, I said to myself, I can do better products than these guys. Actually, remember intrapreneuring? I went to my boss and I said, look, I'm burning with desire to start my own business. Can you foot the bill for me? You know, you, you put in the money, I'll put in the new product, and uh, we'll do 50-50. So he said, oh, let me talk to my uh, accountants who came, and they turned me down. They said they didn't like the idea. So my boss said, sorry, young man, you're on your own. Well, then I came back to California, started my own business. That would be 1985. Uh, I was so driven that it took me one day to establish a company, another two, three days to furnish it, including the labs. I was just flying, man. I was like 10, 20 hours a day, just do nothing but this. Where did you get the money out of that? Well, we had a house in New York. We sold that. In fact, Julia and my wife sold that. And, uh, we used that money to start this business, but if we lost it, the business, we would have nothing, nothing. I would have to start from scratch again. So uh, I give my wife a lot of credit for putting up with me. I'm crazy at, at times, you know. So we started the company. We put out some good products. You can see that on, on our website. Some of the distributors from the old company, they joined me. They said, well, this guy has better product. So that kind of kept me going for a while. But then uh, I based most of my products on IPNs, which nobody else uses, interpenetrating polymer networks. And uh, that, that was my thesis when I was in uh, uh, Manchester University. So uh, I kind of commercialized those ideas. It basically, it's a hybrid system. And, um, so a lot of companies started testing it, liking it. Uh, this is what you can do with IPNs. Competing engineering requirements can be met. For example, if somebody wants something very hard, but at the same time flexible, we can do it. But nobody else can, because it's either hard, inflexible, or soft and flexible. But if they want competing engineering requirements, you can do it with IPNs. So that's what I offered to the uh, marketplace. The other, remember in one of the slides I said, make a difference. My difference was IPNs plus zero VOC coatings. At the time, solvents were a big problem in Los Angeles area. Rule 66 came out so bad that uh, uh, they created a air quality management district. So, um, there were chemists who specialized on solvents, whereas I did away with all the solvents. And I said, zero solvent. They thought I was crazy. But I was doing it because I was using low molecular weight polymers as solvents itself, and then uh, using mid-sized mid, mid oligomers and higher polymers, and creating this syrup, and it worked. So that fast forwarding to this year, we started, like we split our business in two areas. One is the uh, uh, corrosion business, and the other one is the aerospace business. On the aerospace side, we're creating coatings that are uh, invisible to radar. So um, to make a long story short, you have to make a difference. You can't be a me too company coming online. So um, if you have a good idea, chase it. But to, to you young people, I recommend put three, four, five years of industrial e experience behind you. Um, and hopefully make it in two, three different companies. And then if you want to start your own business, you can start your own business. Be brave, be honest you'll be very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one there. Well, engineering caused lots of environmental problems, like, you know, uh, uh, like pollutions. 
something like that is a byproduct of you know uh, those uh, materials used in petrol uh, you know, petrochemical companies. Would you uh, would you think that using that can we fix those uh, environmental issues that we have using? I, I, I truly believe that you can, but here's the thing. Approach is very important. Let's say uh, that you, you talked about a certain problem. That I'll give you a more generic approach. Let's say problem is X. We want to solve this problem. First, we have to understand the problem. Uh, polluted air. In fact, uh, Ilknor's background is in uh, clean air and all that in, in, his pre in, in her uh, previous life. And... Uh, First, you have to understand what's in the air. Well, these bad guys are in the air. Two, where are they coming from? Well, these companies are producing them. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, first, you can go and talk to them. If they can stop that, that's a quick way out. But if it's something not stoppable, now you have to find a solution. What can you do? Well, you can do filtering. How can you do that? Well, there's charcoal, activated charcoal. Maybe you can create some filters and pass the air through there, and all the dirt stuff stays there and clean air comes out. Well, that's one way. There are other ways. There are water filters, other things. So that's where brainstorming comes. It, it, people like you get together, three, four, five of you, and you throw out ideas. And one of them says, hey, you know what? That's a winner. Let's do it. Let's go behind that. That's how problems are solved. He was talking about non-VOC. VOC stands for volatile organic chemicals. Right. These are all the solvents and stuff. So he found something that he doesn't use solvents, but it would do the same thing. So it would become innovative. Well, can, can I accomplish this thing without using solvents? So you find replacements, and then there's no pollution. So you don't have a pollution issue. Right. We call that preventive measure instead of corrective measure. You mentioned corrective measure. Can we find a corrective measure for this? What we found out was preventive measure. We, we don't create it in the first place. But uh, the, the idea is that it's a multidisciplinary approach. You need to have help from others. You create a good team. Remember I mentioned teamwork? That's what I mean. So originally, you were working outside the standard when you started to create all these processes, and you developed a standard behind that. How did you manage your product liability at the beginning? How did you go through the process of determining where your risks were and figuring out, OK, like what resources did you have? OK, very, very good question. First of all, you have to have uh, insurance for your products. OK? That means insurance companies decide, not you. They come in, look at you, look at your operation, look at your claims. You have a, a product, I mean, brochure, if you say, uh, I have a product that cures uh, everything, including cancer. They won't insure you. They'll say good luck to you. But if you say um, something reasonable, like this might solve problem X, and they will ask around and then come back to you a few days later, will say, OK, we'll insure you for X amount. So um, the answer to your question is really insurance companies decide on that. Okay, I, I guess my question is along those lines, but also addressing, so you have your own labs. You right. must have other independent labs that we're testing. What yes. You're doing, and that's how you confirm the data. That's and right. Or you can set a standard or build a proprietary standard that people would purchase. That's so. correct. That's correct. Like, uh, um, there's another company. As I said, I don't want to mention names, but this is a uh, federally chartered uh, laboratory, big laboratory. So there are certain dollar amounts for each test. You would take your product to them and say, do test X for me, and here's the money. So they'll do it, issue a report, and that report is what you use because it's a third party independent report, not my report. If I can say anything I want on my report, that's not uh, valid. But those guys, if they say, this is the uh, impact strength, this is the you know, tensile strength, it's uh, reliable. So how do you, like, in, like, your specific company, like, how do you collaborate with, like, other, like, engineers with, like, for example, like, mechanical, electrical, like, how Very good question. Very good question. Uh, industry is a very uh, robust 
world. People talk to each other all the time. We get 10 calls a day. Usually, people with problems call you. And if I have problems, I'll call others. They will call and say, look, I have this problem. Do you think your, your product X solved this? I'll, I'll say something like, well, either, oh, I know we have done it and it works. Or I will say, I don't know, but we can check it out. So immediately, a team is established. Likewise, if I have a problem with my manufacturing, I'll call company XYZ and ask them, you know, well, this is the problem, and uh, can you help me? They'll usually say, OK, if we solve this problem, how much are you going to buy from us? Well, I'll buy like $100 worth. Clink, they'll, they'll just won't talk to you. They won't talk to you. But if you say, well, annually, I will buy from you X amount, now uh, there's a carrot for them. They'll come and help you. You'll go there. So you establish that team. It's, 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 a, it's a very robust system. So if you call the company, you can do an online search, and oh, you see that company A, B, C, do what you do. They probably know more. You call them up, introduce yourself, introduce the problem. They'll help you if there is uh, a, a, even the slightest uh, possibility of making money for them. So industry works on profitability. They, it, it's, it's, it's not a charity thing. So, uh, but they will work with you. So does that answer your question? Yeah. And like, what type of like, specific like, product would you like, apply for those skills of like, collaboration? Well, collaboration can range, range uh, from uh, testing it. Well, you have um, testing grounds, A, B, C. Could we use our product, test it there, and can we get a report from you? Or it could be, I have problems, can you solve it? Or it could be, I realize you have some problems. We think we have the solution. It, it's like uh, pushing your business a little bit into their uh, atmosphere, which is fine. And uh, most businesses don't like solicitation like that. But if, if you're really on the target, if you're talking about their problem, uh, they'll, they'll listen to you. So um, it could be a, a wide variety of uh, uh, communication and, and cooperation based on how serious uh, your problem is, if they can provide solutions or vice versa. Um, can you tell them also about how you hit the big one? Like you were that little company oh. nobody knew about and then something happened. Well, it's, it's a funny story. I mean, uh, okay. Here, I, I can't name companies, uh, but a very large company uh, put out uh, a, a bid saying that we need uh, product X. Uh, if you're interested in formulating it for us, please come to our headquarters in such and such place at such and such time. So I went there, but the big guys showed up too. And when I say big guys, I mean like Fortune 500 guys. So um, we're around the table like this, and uh, and the big leaders of the company, uh, they go around the table and everybody introduces themselves. They say, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so uh, with so-and-so company, and this is my team, four or five people. And they'll go, great. And then, well, I'm so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, and these are my colleagues, you know, thank you. And I'm so-and-so. It came to me, and I introduced myself, and I said, I'm with Integrated Polymer Industries. There's nobody behind me, of course. And they don't know me. They don't know my company. And I could see uh, the big guys going like this. <laughs> OK, thank you, and then move on. So they're probably asking, who's this guy? Where did he come from? I mean, well, why is he? So anyway, they said, we need uh, a product by such and such date. You know what? I listened to them very, very carefully, took notes, asked questions. and. Within less than a week, my prototype was on their table right there. The others were still talking. They were having interdepartmental meetings. Memos were flying, asking for budget, asking for time, asking for permission. I already delivered the product. So anyway, after a while, they delivered theirs. They started testing first round, which is tensile strength and compressive strength. Uh, out of 10 companies, we were reduced down to like six. Then they did hot, wet, cold tests. We dropped down to three. And then they did some uh, uh, you know, beam studies, electronic beams. 
we're down to two. And then they did some peel strength. The peel strength is you just peel it like this. Uh, strength of adhesion. We're down to one. That's me. And these are all what they call blind tests. They don't know whose product they're testing. It's just like uh, company one, company two, company three. But they don't know company three is this gentleman here. So when they remove it, they see our name there. That's how we got it. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it myself. I mean, uh, so they said, well, you got it now. We need, uh, they started placing the orders. The bottom line in all this is that if I were intimidated by the size of those big guys, I would not be at that desk. Do you agree? I would not. I would say, oh, man, I can't do it. And look at the size of these guys. But no, I went there. What could I lose? They could tell me, we don't deal with small companies. Get out of here. Fine, thanks. What else? Well, we checked your product. It stinks. Fine, thanks. I'll go somewhere else. So, but, but you have to do this. You have to do this. I don't know what you would call this, but I would say uh, you should not be intimidated by the size of any company or competition or by the education of it, by the whatever money of it. No. You are you. You are a special person. You just go right in. You charge in. <clears throat> we have not gone into bankruptcy, but there were two years where we were really um, almost there. We couldn't get paid on some of the products we sold. Uh, some of the companies that we sold to went bankrupt without paying us, things like that. And, um, but that also taught us lessons. Uh, we know now who to work with, how to work with, and some of them, like, we get advanced payments, this and that. So there are ways that you can do it. But to answer your question, uh, we didn't go bankrupt because I, I, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. But uh, we came very close twice. How, how did what? Well, it, it, let me tell you one, one thing. I mean, here, here's, it's, it's, it's a very uh, personal experience. For example, uh, you have workers, they work. You pay their money. They go and eat, but there's nothing left in your pocket. You wear suit and tie, but you have no pocket here, no, no money here, because you paid all the, uh, uh, all the people, the employees. And that's what you do first. So, but those are the times when you're even sharper. You work twice as much, and, and you think a lot harder. You develop more. You, you, you're, you're in the game. You're persistent. It's like a boxing match. You get a, you get a impactful uh, fist, and you're on the floor. What are you going to do? Stay there? I say, get up, you know, dust off, and keep fighting. That's what I did. So don't be scared of bankruptcy. What is that? So you can start a new, new company. But with this time, you wouldn't make the same mistakes you did the last time. That's what we call experience. We don't say, we made a mistake. We say we learned a lot. You want to develop a product, but you don't have the like the initial capital to develop it or to you know, start it. Um, how do you how will you find capital? Okay, this is what you can do. A. You can see if there are companies who would be interested in your ideas. That's very important. B. That's the fastest way because if there's a company like that, they'll say, Hey, come on over. We'll see what we can do. B, if nobody is interested in your idea, ideas and you really believe in yourself and your product, then you start um, raising funds from friends, family, sell your stuff, do whatever it is. And make, make it, in fact, getting some partners, some investors. All of these are up. There are new tools in the internet, you know. Um, you can start a fundraising campaign there for you and give shares to the companies or whatever. Uh, there are many ways. But let me tell you also this. We get a lot of uh, calls from a lot of people saying, oh, I have this great idea. Can you help us out? Well, A, I don't know anything about what you're doing. B, I don't know if there are a million other versions of it which are better than yours. I, I have no idea. So I have to turn them down. 
The reason I'm telling this to you is that you select the companies you go to so they understand you and they're interested in your product. And, and that, that'll be a very fast uh, way of getting into the business. And one thing, a little bit conflicts with what you said earlier. You talked about having a job at different corporations for a few years. And I would add into that, while you're doing that job, whatever it is you have in your mind, you do that as a hobby, okay? Do it in your side time. Instead of doing, you know, going out with friends, maybe you lock yourself in your own little lab and, and work on it. And he was talking about you want to have a business in place for a few years before the bank will talk with you. Well, if you think you've got something going, start a company. Maybe just a business card and a letterhead and, and a bank account, but get it started. Show that it's established. But if you start doing that as a side business, I can't tell you. How many people I know who started businesses as hobby companies that they then made successful? Okay. Uh, and by the way, I've known Aragon since he started this company just about, and he is the hardest working man I've ever met in my life. So you got to better understand that is another factor if you're going to be successful. You've got to be willing to work your butt off. And, and you he do, still does. And if you do, you'll be successful because he's also one of the most successful people I've ever known in my life. Well, thank you, David. Um, uh, David is right. By the way, David is an uh, innovator in my book. He innovated a lot of uh, uh, materials, so I have a lot of respect for his ideas. Uh, but I can't stress how important it is to persevere, to work hard. Uh, I'm not going to fool you. My day starts at 5 a.m. And, and it ends at around 10.30, 11. So that's my sleeping period, the, the, whatever I do. Nobody's forcing me, don't get me wrong. But uh, it, it's, it's like, you know, this is all I know. This is all I know. Um, you, you can't rest on your laurels. Remember this slide here I showed? Do not rest on your laurels. Because uh, there are a million other companies who can replace me tomorrow, just like that. So that's why I was constantly researching and developing new avenues, new improvements, and so on. Any other questions? I hope you guys got inspired. I mean, I'm like, oh, I would go and, you know, like, you know, we are at the end of our lives, so you guys are the next generation. So we want you guys to be inspired and kind of trust yourselves and just believe in yourselves. And that's why I wanted Ergen to come and tell you, like, as a third party, um, don't let anyone tell you you can or cannot do anything. Like, um, I, I mean, it's just, I have many similar stories because we are from the same ethnic background. So when I was applying as a grad student to the United States, I applied to Caltech. And people told me, I am crazy, you know, because I'll never get in there. And guess what? I did. Okay, I always remind myself, I got into Caltech for crying out loud. And that is a big deal. I didn't even know. I was just talking to Inanu, which actually became a prime minister, and he was the dean in my school. I said, do you know that school, Caltech? He says, ah, are you going there? I said, yeah, I think they just offered me some money. and goes, oh, just I'll pay for your plane ticket. So um, believe in yourself. You know, you have an idea. And don't say, oh, maybe somebody else has an idea. How do you know that? Maybe you're the only one who thought about it. And uh, sometimes an idea starts with the simplest little thing. He was just mixing stuff in his garage or like in a lab and came up with a way to do certain things that nobody else could think of. So um, just constantly think about how can I innovate something? How can I use this education? It's just doing things on the paper, that's great. You have to do that anyway and you have to get your A's and transfer and all that stuff. That's a given. But what else are you going to do? You know, it's not just for money. What else are you going to do? It's for the humanity, for, you know, environment or whatever. And uh, just think about it. I think that's what you can take home today. Just think about it. Cook up some ideas and become more involved with ASICs. Like, cook up. And I've been telling my kids for the longest time, come up with an app. We can make lots of millions. You know, and uh, if you can 
program a little bit. Why not? Just try something that nobody else we could think of. Yeah, so knock yourself out. Yeah, well, I, I'd like to end this uh, session with one question. I told you for about an hour uh, it's about innovation and making a difference. So I end up with this question. Are you going to make a difference? You, 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 you. Are you going to make a difference? Are you going to make a difference? Ask this question to yourself. Are you going to make a difference? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.